Testing, testing, one, two, three. Video is live. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Electoral Area Services Committee meeting of uh, May 18th, 2022. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. And with that, I'd like to turn to the first item on the agenda, please, Ms. Ferguson. Yes, that'll be approval of the agenda with uh, a couple amendments. We have deletion of item D1. Um, the uh, the uh, delegation has decided to withdraw their application. Uh, Jessica Petrowski from Doodlebug Learning Center read bylaws surrounding daycares in Shawnigan Lake. And we have the addition also of two new business items. Um, uh, supplemental information to item R1, application number DVP 21B05 for 1476 Shawnigan Lake Road. PID number uh, 031-188320. And supplemental information to item R1 as well. Pardon me, application number DVP1B05. Um, and that the agenda be amended, um, uh, uh, sorry, that the agenda as amended be approved. Okay, thank you very much. Any other changes? Seeing none. Okay, uh, that's been moved. A seconder, please. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. <clears throat> and that'll be the adoption of the minutes. Okay, I moved. Seconder. Seconded any discussion? None. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item, please. So we have no business arising from the minutes and just checking public input period. Uh, no people for public input. Uh, and we have the delegation that has pulled out. So we have correspondence, a C1, uh, grant and aid request, electoral area C, Cobble Hill, Reshawnigan Cobble Hill Farmers Institute and Agricultural Society. And the recommendation is uh, that the board uh, approve a grant and aid for electoral area C, Cobble Hill, in the amount of $1,000 be provided to the Shawnigan Cobble Hill Farmers Institute and Agricultural Society to support the staging of the 113th Cobble Hill Fair. Okay, that's been moved, seconded. Discussion, all in favor? Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. And the next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, C2 is grant and aid request. Electoral Area C, Cobble Hill, Re Francis Kelsey Secondary School. And the recommendation is that a grant and aid for Electoral Area C, Cobble Hill, in the amount of $1,000, be provided to Francis Kelly Secondary School for five $200 bursaries for five graduating students that reside in Electoral Area C, Cobble Hill to support their future education or training. Thank you. That's been moved. Seconded. Any discussion? Go ahead, Director Wilson. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick word of thanks to the finance department for setting me on the right road uh, as I'd read the report wrongly, thought I'd run out of money, but actually I got pots and pots of money left. So thank you, first of all, to the other area directors who responded to my plea for more money as I thought I'd run out to give to other people in the area. Um, Cobble Hill Events Society will be starting up music in the park again this year, which is great. So they now have a contribution from me as well. So thank you to Finance for explaining where I was going wrong. Thank you. Very good. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. And that'll be C3, Mr. Chair, is a grant and aid request, Electoral Area D, Cowich and Bay, Re Francis Kelsey Secondary School. Uh, and it is recommended that a grant and aid for Electoral Area D, uh, pardon me, Electoral Area D, Cowich and Bay, in the amount of $1,000 be provided to Francis Kelsey Secondary School for two $500 bursaries for two graduating students that reside in Electoral Area D, Cowich and Bay, to support their future education or training. Yeah, so that's been moved. Seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. And that'll be under reports for R1 is a report from the Development Services Division, reapplication number DVP 21B05 for 1476 Shawnigan Lake Road, PID number 03118820. And it's recommended that the Development Variance Permit number DVP 21B05. 1476 Shawnigan Lake Road, PID 03118820, be issued. And that an exemption to the Shawnigan Lake Flood Hazards Bylaw number 4348 be granted in accordance with the RISOC uh, Geotechnical Report. Great, thank you. So, will we be hearing from anyone on staff? There we go. Rashenda, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe my applicants are, they are in the lobby. I'm not sure if they've been admitted yet. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, admit them if we oh, can. I see them. They have been, okay, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I will be presenting this application. Um, if you can just move to the uh, next slide there, please. So the subject property is bounded on the east by Shawnigan Lake Road, on the south by an adjacent residential property, and on the north and west by Shawnigan Lake itself. Uh, the, ma the majority of this property is within the streamside protection and enhancement area. The property currently contains an existing single family dwelling that was originally constructed in 1917 and has undergone multiple renovations over the years. Next slide, please. All right, so the applicant is proposing the demolition and reconstruction of the existing dwelling. A team of professionals have assessed the existing dwelling and have determined that numerous structural deficiencies and non-compliance with the BC Building Code have rendered a simple renovation not cost effective. Um, during the course of this variance application, as staff worked through it with the applicants, the CVRD adopted bylaw number 4348, the Shawnigan Lake Flood Management Bylaw, which requires a flood construction level of 120 meters. The applicant proposes an amendment to the bylaw to permit for the construction of, oh gosh, I always get this word wrong, habitable area, habitable area, <laughs> at an elevation of 119.35 meters instead of the 120 meters. A geotechnical engineer reviewed the site and proposed development uh, and has determined that the 119.35 meter flood construction labor level is safe for the intended use. Uh, additionally, with this application, um, due to size constraints of the property, including horizontal and vertical proximity to Shawnigan Lake, um, the following sections of electoral area B um, are proposed to be varied, um, section 8.4 uh, B2 to increase the maximum permitted height for a principal dwelling from 10 meters to 11.32, uh, section 8.4 B3 to reduce the front parcel line setback from 7.5 meters to 2.48 meters. And I'm just gonna add that there it was a MOTI um, 
permit issued for that as well. And then section uh, 5.14a to reduce the setback from a water course from 15 meters to 5.31 meters. So if you um, advance the slide, you'll see there is a rendering here. Um, it's much prettier than the renderings that follow that I've tried to do. Um, so I thought I'd show you this first so you can keep this in your mind. Oh, sorry, we can just go back up one second. Yeah, um, if you can keep, keep that in your mind as I take you through the next uh, Im images that I've tried to sort of show you what the site will look like afterwards. Um, so if you can just advance to the next slide now. Thank you. So um, staff did conduct, conduct a site visit. Um, so these photos are all from that site visit. Uh, just a couple of things to note on this one. Um, the shed is actually proposed to be removed as well. Currently it is constructed partially within the road right of way. Um, and the fence is also within the, the road right of way. So the fence is going to be aligned with the proper uh, front parcel line as well. And next slide, please. So this is just this is one of those renderings that I tried to get artistic with. Um, so I've I've done my best to give you a um, idea, a rough idea of what the new house footprint may look like. Um, so that's what that blue line is. Um, obviously, you've got they have complied with the three meter setback to the uh, south property for that's a internal side parcel line. Um, we've got the two point four eight meters to the front parcel line and then I was just trying to show you a bit of um, what might change on the the north side as well the driveway will be replaced with permeable pavers and next slide please so this again is just um, in the in the report I did mention there is a two meter extension towards the north property line um, which will mainly be where that um, that orange line is and that's mostly just for a concrete walkway and stairs, um, which are required due to you know, raising the, the height of the building up to the 119.35 meters, and then um, have need some stairs to get down to the surrounding lawn area. And next slide, please. And this is just um, from the back of the property, from the existing dock. Uh, so the applicant is proposing um, landscape improvements as well. They are looking at that riparian area. They are proposing native um, replantings as well as softening that shoreline. Um, and staff have informed that, that, that sorry, staff have informed them that to um, proceed with softening the shoreline and changing anything within the water itself, um, they do require a section 11 agreement. And I think the next slide, yes, here we go. Um, so then the recommendation is as it reads before you there. Okay, thank you, Ms. Woods. Um, if we take the PowerPoint down, we'll see if there's any questions. Go ahead, uh, Director Acton. Thank you. Um, um, I, I can understand some of the challenges that they're faced here um, with here. The softening of the riparian air or the, the shoreline, um, I, I looked at that work and, and it obviously needs to be done and ideally to have that retaining wall removed would be the best with either, well, I'm not a QEP obviously, but uh, what... I think what I think their drawings showed the kind of bouldering that is uh, kind of layered down into the water. So I hope that happens. I guess um, do we have an opportunity with this to take a, any kind of large deposit to ensure that that kind of work happens? Is one of my questions. Okay, Ms. Woods. Um, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, we will be taking a deposit um, for. When they remove the shed, um, there will be planting required there. Um, that's on the more of the north side of the property. Um, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not sure if we can require the deposit um, for voluntary works, um, but I'm not sure if um, maybe Ms. Chera or Mr. Sermat can um, have a little bit more information around that, but we will be requiring deposit for at least the, I think it's 242 meters squared um, area that the the 
shed is in right now and then will be replanted. Well, I guess um, it, it, this is a little challenging because it's not actually necessary to have th these variants uh, permits. They could build a, a place that would fit on the current footprint. And, but, you know, it's kind of nice to, to grant that if we know for sure that uh, there's movement forward in proving the, the foreshore. Um, and I guess my other question is, so right now a lot of discussion in Shawnee and Lake, especially with our new harmonized OCP, is the form and character around the lake. And I have to say that once I saw their drawing, uh, you know, this big modern look is really not very Shawnigan looking. It actually looks, I can see that, you know, uh, some paint and everything on what they have there right now would, <laughs> is kind of like more in character for, for the area. And um, it's kind of a, uh, you know, I guess that's what they, obviously that's the style they want, but it, it's kind of a shame when we uh, mix in these, uh, anyway, I guess that's, it's it's just not uh, very lake looking. Um, and I guess it's just something, I, I, is this the kind of application that could go to the commission first? Because perhaps I'm just not looking at it with a fair view here. Okay, thank you. Um, could, this, think, could, could this go to the APC? Ms. Charles? Three, Mr. Chair, yes, if you wish to refer the application to your, your APC, um, you, you can do that, absolutely. Um, and you can also consider conditions in conjunction with permits that you issue, provided they're um, reasonably li related to the, the permit itself. So if there's um, an in, uh, perceived impact that a variance might have on um, either a neighboring property or waterfront, and you would um, feel that um, some sort of condition might help to mitigate that impact, that that is something that the committee could explore as well. Okay, thank you. So before um, I, I see you, Director Morrison, I think, do we have the applicants with us? If they would like to, uh, I'd like to welcome them and ask if they'd like to say anything. Uh, now might be a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you? Can everyone hear me? All right. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. It's Mr. Wiley. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, ahead. so I am the uh, the designer on the project, representing the clients, and a um, couple things to bring up just on the conversation points. Certainly, with the Section Eleven, uh, you know, clients' intention is to to move forward with a soft uh, shore approach. Uh, that's something that they've elected to do, and we've had that uh, landscape plan in effect prior to the requirement uh, to apply for it uh, anyways. So um, we're confident and, and motivated to, to complete that, and uh, we will go through the steps. Um, as for the, uh, the general aesthetic, um, you know, I, I think we're starting to see um, a lot more of the contemporary design. Um, and in particularly how it ties to the, the proposed floodplain bylaw, there, there are, I think you're going to see a lot of height concerns in regards to this and how it's all calculated. Um, and the advent of trying to, to get more usable space by using more flat roof or low slope structures, which is uh, what we were attempting to achieve here. Okay, thank you. So I'll go to Director Morrison for questions to either the applicant or staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is through to, I, I think probably, well, perhaps uh, Ms. Drell for or the author of the report here. Um, so I I get Director Acton's concerns and, and, and thoughts around some of what she, she shared, but um, when we, especially when we're considering some of the items later in the report, when I don't believe Shawnigan has a form and character uh, development permit. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering what the in, intent or the outcome would be for a referral because essentially in, in some of what we're looking at a little later, we're, we're going to be 
you know, setting down in policy that when we refer things to our APCs or, or Parks Commissions that it be defined that they consider the matter that is of referral that can be considered under the permit. So just some clarification, Ms. Terrell, perhaps, uh, because I think you uh, had a lot to do with the documents that we'll be looking at later. Uh, Ms. For you, um, Mr. Chair, to Director Morrison. So uh, there, yes, there's no form and character development permit area that's applicable to this site. Form and character um, development permit areas cannot be applied um, to single family sites in, in most circumstances. So we aren't able to evaluate the merits of the, the design of the building um, and the aesthetics of the building in this case. It would be purely about um, the proposal in relation to the zoning regulations. Okay, next I have Director Nicholson. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I am interested in knowing how much larger the footprint is of the uh, house. Yeah, I would like to take that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can, I can attempt. I'm, I'm actually not sure now that I think about it how I don't have the number off the top of my head how big the existing footprint is. I do know there is a net reduction overall, um, but obviously the net reduction in parcel coverage overall um, has to do with the removal of the um, the shed as well. So you, they do go from. Currently, they're sitting at 29.4% parcel coverage, and they will be going down to 29% parcel coverage. I'm not sure, um, perhaps if uh, Ryan or Dave know the, the existing size of the footprint, then they might be able to speak to that. Yes, absolutely. I'll just give you some numbers here, and I'm just quickly crunching the math. But the um, as per the development permit plans, the existing house footprint is 172.8 meters square. And the proposed is 218.6. Uh, once again, to note the previous accessory building was 48.1 meters squared, which is being removed for uh, a, a net loss overall. Okay, thank you, Mr. Willie. Go ahead and follow up, Director Nicholson. Thank you. So um, it, we're, we're right close to the lake here and we have an opportunity to really try and improve the um, the environmental impact through this new development, and it, it's quite a high lot coverage, which is I think significant. And so my question is, why can we not require um, some sort of a, a deposit on the ripe, riparian restoration around the lake shore? Because I think that's super important, and I I don't. I just think that should be tied up. Um, and I know that the, the, the applicants intend to do that, but it would be nice to make sure that it actually happens for sure for the community. Okay, any comment uh, perhaps, Ms. Charles? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it, it is reasonable to request that security be taken in conjunction with um, issuance of a development variance permit in this case. It sounds like the applicants have prepared um, a landscape plan and it would be a matter of um, assessing the value of the works and taking a um, security in conjunction with that plan. So the, um, in essence, the, um, the board could issue the variance subject to receipt of security to complete the proposed landscape work. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Willie, I can't see if you want to speak, um, maybe in the chat, if you don't have video, I can't, I can't tell if you had something to add, but uh, I'll wait to hear from you. Sure. Um, you know, once again, I, I, I don't think we're going to have an issue with that. My understanding is that we're, we're already committing a deposit for the riparian area work on the actual property. Um, and we're solely talking about the section 11 work along the, the lake shore. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have Director Kuhn next. I move to option one. Okay, Director Acton, did you, were you seconding that or did you want to comment? Comment, go ahead. That was not seconded, so I'll just go to Director Acton. You know, I, I'd, I would actually feel more comfortable if this went to the APC. 
I don't see an issue uh, with referring it. It is uh, really, uh, there were there were a couple other things that Ms. Charles had mentioned that could be incorporated and I didn't, I should have wrote them down. So, so now they've, they've escaped me, but uh, just, uh, you know, recognizing that we could, and, and I can see that the intent is to make this property better, but I would like the community input towards that. We, I, I've seen, even just last year, there was two uh, variance permits that we granted and the front, the foreshore wasn't shared with us. And there's, there's no plan of removing any kind of walls and those uh, properties still have walls and, and we missed a, an opportunity of making those properties better and they're definitely not better. So um, I think that it's really important to have the community's input it, for almost all uh, properties along the lake in, in this regards. Okay, so you're moving referral to the APC? I think it would be really important, yes. Do we have a seconder for that? Seeing none, okay. I'm sorry, am I able to comment still? Yeah, go ahead, um, Mr. Wiley. Sure, I'll just mention as well that we've engaged with all of our neighbors and we do have support. Um, we have uh, provided letters of support from, from two properties and we've engaged with our neighbor directly to the south, uh, which was positive as well. Um, so, I mean, the community the uh, immediate support around our neighborhood is positive um, and there hasn't been any negative comment about the development. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Director Acton. I guess um, something else that just came to mind too is just um, like, per I, I don't remember seeing any kind of parking provided for this property. Okay, who, who can speak to parking? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can, I can take that. So the parking for this would be um, in, in the driveway area. So they, they are pro uh, proposing to take out the existing um, concrete and asphalt that is there and then replace it with the permeable pavers. I wrote down what they're called, but I don't have it off or something um and so that is the proposal and that is where um the parking is intended for the property okay thank you director morrison uh thank you mr chair i, th I think this is through to Ms. Trelf again so um i just in listening to the conversation and, and at the meetings that i'm at where there's a lot of discussion about the uh, development of the dapper process and and the needs to um have our our applications go through in a, a reasonable format so if i'm if i'm not mistaken what i heard was the uh the 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 variances are or the site coverage is is about the same that the applicant is amenable to uh, the 125 percent security um, of uh, uh, bond or, or or letter of credit and and there's, there's still this consideration to refer to the APC and and yet I think those are the two areas are the the variance and the security um, if we refer to to the APC, uh, like I, I guess, are we referring to something that the APC is actually supposed to be within our regulations commenting on? Like, if if we've got a, a qualified environmental professional who's designed a plan, we don't normally send APC uh, send items to APCs to comment on qualified professionals report so I'm I'm a little confused about or is this sort of requiring more and going into um, uh, beyond what our current permits development permits and repairing regulations permit Ms. Charles through you Mr. Chair so I would suggest that if um, you were to refer something it would be the development variance permit application, not the development permit application for the reasons that you've noted. So the question would be about the um, suitability or um, feasibility of a, of a variance to, um, to the setbacks that are noted. Um, it may be challenging for 
um, volunteer APC members to comment on um, the request for the floodplain exemption because that's um, you know early in the court of uh, professionals at the determined. But there is a question around um, the discretionary nature of variances. So that would be um, what you would be seeking the APC's recommendations on the suitability of a variance or one or more variances in this particular case, variances to the zoning bylaw. And okay, yes, thank I you. Would, would not suggest that you request um, the APC comment on um, professional recommendations around the riparian areas protection regulation. Thank you. Follow so up, is, Director Morrison. Well, that's sort of the nub of the question here. It, it sounded to me like Director Acton was looking for more direction from the community on on foreshore and the likes and and so if if that's the intent then i can't support it if it's clearly on the nature of the of the variances and and the the limited scope of that then okay if if you know that's the intent of what the referral is but sure okay director clearly actually. that's the intent okay and you're assuring that then okay so i will second that any discussion on that? Go ahead, Director Nicholson. Sorry, I was just seconding. Okay. No further discussion? Okay, I'd like to call the question. Um, are we clear what it is then? It's uh, to refer to the APC for discussion of the variance permit, correct? Okay. Let's call the question. All in favor? Opposed? One opposed motion carries. Thank you. Let's move to the next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. And thank you, Mr. Wiley. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, R2 is a report from Development Services Division, reapplication number DVP 21F01 for 9887 uh, Stinqua Road, PID number uh, 027 247 uh, uh, and this was referred from the April 21st, 2021 uh, EASC committee meeting. Thank you. Uh, and the recommendation is that uh, the development variance permit uh, DVP 21F01 uh, be issued. Okay. Thank you. So Ms. Woods, you have a presentation? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this subject property is uh, located on private gated strata road with the CVRD park directly to the west of the lot. The property contains an existing single family dwelling and retaining wall in the rear yard. Next slide, please. The applicant is proposing to construct a two level 111.95 meters squared garage with covered entryway and finished recreation room to replace an existing unenclosed parking area. The first story will be below road grade and will be a recreation room for hobbies. The second story will be a garage which will be level with the road elevation. Due to the location of the existing, existing house, the proposed structure will encroach into the front parcel line setback. The applicant is applying to vary the front parcel line setback from 7.5 meters to 3.1 meters. And I believe the next slide is the uh, recommendation that is before you. And I do believe the applicant is, um, is online as well. Great, thank you. And uh, welcome to the applicant. Uh, don't know if I see a name. So Mr. Smith? Uh, correct. Smith. Okay, Smith, okay, welcome. If you have video, you could put it on, I'm not sure. Okay. Assume he's he or she is there, uh, Director Morrison. I thought we'd uh, if the applicant had any desire to share before I uh, speak. Okay. Sorry, K Smith, we can't uh, hear you. So, I don't know if uh, you can do anything about that. Uh, the applicant is actually muted. Oh, hi. Um, my name is. Oh, perfect. Just yes, welcome. Hi, sorry about that. Sorry, could you repeat your question? 
Yeah, we just were inviting you to, uh, if you had any comments on the application before we turn to questions. No, it's looked great on our end. My client's are very happy with it. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, we'll go to the committee now and see what kind of questions or comments we might have. Thank you. Don't see any. Director Morrison. Move the staff recommendation. That's been moved, seconded. Okay. Any further comments? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. That was a quick one. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks. attending. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. All right. Thank you. Um, we have time. Let's turn to the next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. R3 is a report from the Development Services Division, reapplication number RZ21B03 for 2628-2633 and 2663 Kia Crescent. And the uh, recommendation is that this application be denied. Okay, thank you. And I see uh, we have a presentation. Ms. Herrera, are you here? Uh Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, I'm substituting for Sheila, so long as my uh, internet holds up. It's been windy here, but... Um, okay. Well, welcome, she, Mr. Tippett. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is an application in respect of three properties on Kia Crescent in electoral area B. Uh, it was initiated as a result of bylaw enforcement action. Uh, thanks, Stefan. This is the map that shows the three subject properties. They're outlined in a dark black... Um, shade here, uh, or, or outline perimeter. The uh, three parcels are all uh, in the vicinity of 0.2 hectares, or, you know, one is slightly over 2,000 square meters, the other two are slightly below that. All three of them have uh, secondary suites on the property, and it's uh, the regulation in electoral area B is such that uh, you have to have 0.4 hectares of land or 4,000 square meters, so more than double uh, two of the parcel sizes and uh, substantially more than the larger uh, of the three parcels as well. And so this has led to um, a site-specific request that, as I say, arose out of bylaw enforcement action to rezone these three parcels alone for uh, the ability, ability to have suites. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. I think that's maybe the recommendation. Um, the recommendation is to deny. Now, the, the staff report from Sheila actually sets out the, the reasons fairly well. We have, um, there are probably a fair number of uh, non-conforming or let's say illegal non-conforming suites. We are in the context of um, the modernization of the zoning bylaw, going to be taking a deeper look at uh, suite regulations um, and you know, seeing if there's some way to maybe liberalize them a bit or, uh, you know, open up the possibility on a, on a community-wide or zone-wide basis. I think the challenge that uh, Ms. Herrera pointed out in her report is that uh, dealing with um, each violation as a rezoning, as a one-off, would take an awful lot of time and uh, uh, therefore the recommendation from her was to deny this application. Uh, there was a second option in her report, which uh, you could take a look at if that's of any interest. So that's what I have to say about it, and I'll try and answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead, Director Alton. Sorry, Director Alton, you're muted. Sorry. I have a couple questions. My first question is, what was, uh, so it ha it's supposed to be 0.4 for, for a suite in the house, but w what was the reasoning with the difference of a separate unit with a suite? Like why are some, I think it's a smaller parcel, or it's actually widely uh, more common to be allowed a suite than it is like say a carriage house or something like that what, what what why is that mr chair with your permission um i think you're asking about maybe the difference between the small suite or accessory dwelling unit regulation and the secondary suite regulations we do have throughout the various electoral areas different approaches to this um this issue uh secondary suites of course are ones attached to or within the principal home and um you know, carriage homes or accessory dwellings or small suites or in an area H, they're called separate suites. Um, uh, 
are uh, regulated differently uh, and also have different uh, permitted floor areas in some cases compared to the secondary suites. And so in the context of the overall review of the zoning that's coming up, we're going to take a deep dive into that and see whether any of this makes sense. And if it doesn't, we're going to try and come up with uh, sort of standard rules that, that work for everybody. Uh, so for example, if you're going to permit both types of suites, maybe the floor area should be the same. I mean, ultimately it boils down to um, a, uh, an impression maybe of the, the built form on the property. I mean, the, the justification for limiting uh, or establishing a minimum size of land you have to have in order to have a suite. It's it's based on the ability of the, the property if it doesn't have sewer service, for, for example, to dispose of effluent. That's part of the reason for the regulation. And then the other consideration is the the appearance of the built form over the property and the building massing it creates. And so we're going to have to take a deeper dive into that. The challenge I think that Ms. Herrera was uh, wrestling with when coming up with this report recommendation was, uh, does it make sense to deal with it as a, as a one-off, you know, individual uh, property by property? And uh, apart from being really time consuming, it takes you, takes us away from that sort of more, philosophical look at the issue. Obviously, we want to have lots of housing options in the electoral areas, right? And I, so I think the overriding thing the staff will be looking for is opportunities to, shall I say, liberalize the uh, the regulations, uh, but do it in a systematic way. So that that's what I'm hoping for. Um, at Seanigan, the other thing that's kind of interesting is there there's a, a rule about a property that's within 60 meters of uh, the boundary of Seanigan Lake can't have a, a secondary suite. Um, you know, that's another one that we could take a deeper look at to see if that makes sense, because in some cases it can lead to absurd results, you know, where a really small property, uh, you know, can't have it and one right next to it, which isn't much bigger, might be able to if it's a different shape. Um, I don't know if that's what you were asking, so forgive me if I didn't really answer your question, but I'll be happy to try and answer any others. Yeah, um, thank you wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So I'm glad I, I kind of asked it. Anyway, um, I, I guess I'm glad you mentioned the, the HOCP and the MOCP. Like, I would think that we're moving towards allowing these types of suites. So, um, and, and I'm not actually clear about the second uh, option, but um, that staff have, cho have written out. Um, is this could is this a kind of application that we could just delay or like you know shelf it until we until we finish our HOCP and if at that point it's permitted then we could give the applicant back their their application fees and if it's not permitted then they can then they could decide you know what's the best course of action here to to have it permitted uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's a really good question. There, obviously, there are more than the two options available to the committee. You know, a third option, which isn't listed there, is you know they could decide to approve this application, but still, obviously, hope that uh, staff will have updated regulations that will be general in nature that would prevail and not uh, force others into a situation where they'd have to apply, uh, say, specifically for rezonings, which is one of the main concerns expressed in uh, Ms. Herrera's report. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, and then, then the other side of that is how long would it be fair to leave an open application for rezoning on hold, which I presume the implication would be the bylaw enforcement might, might not uh, be actively pursued during that period, uh, anticipating when uh, whatever the new regulations are will come to be. Now, you know, there, if the new regulations are to come out in the, the overall modernized zoning bylaw, it might be quite a ways off in time. Uh, you know, another thing that's not really listed as an option, but, uh, you know, potentially is available is we could be directed to, we being my division, I guess, of uh, community planning, directed to do some initial work on this issue because it's perhaps considered of uh, key um, interest in terms of the affordability crisis and that sort of thing, and maybe make come up with some interim amendments that might not solve all of the questions, but might resolve a fair number of them on an interim basis. Um, so, yeah, that that would be my thoughts on on that issue. 
Okay, director, I can... Just comment. I, okay. I think something like that might be good if we had some kind of matrix uh, to go by at least until we're... Because to, to approve, let's say we approve this today based on the fact that it will likely be part of our uh, new bylaws, but then if it's not, then we've, it's kind of precedent setting, like either way. So, you know, okay. I, I would like to find a solution that uh, allows this application to either wait or, um, I, yeah, anyway, I'd, well, I'll hear okay. from the rest of the committee. But yeah, I was going to suggest that well, you work on a wording of a motion and all. I have other speakers, but just before though, um, do I see an applicant? Do I see a... a was someone trying to get in, Miss Ferguson? I saw a phone number pop up. The phone number keeps appearing and then disappearing, so I don't know if it's the applicant having issues, um, but I'll okay. try to contact them. Mr. Tibet, I don't know if was the applicant intending to join us? Uh, I, I don't actually know. I'm sorry. It's not my okay. file, actually. It's Sheila Herrera's, but uh, um, it seems it seems to me just on that other question of, you know, if that, that latter option I was discussing earlier was of interest to the committee, maybe an appropriate uh, resolution would be to the effect of uh, uh, referring this matter back to staff with direction for us to report back to committee with some interim general amendment options, uh, not, you know, whether it be confined to Shawnigan Lake or, or look at some of the other communities as well is up to the committee, of course, and report back on those and then possibly uh, that might lead to a general amendment in, in which case this application could be uh, uh, terminated and uh, uh, that's one way to deal with it anyway. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, that's good. And I don't in the interest of uh, moving things along, was it all right? Do you want to move that, Director? Um Okay, I see Director Morrison saying he wants to go first. He was on the list, but I think Director Nicholson, were you? Did you wave at me before? Yeah, I did. And okay, I think we might have an applicant joining us. Hello? I don't know if you can hear me. We just see your phone number on the screen. Doesn't seem they can hear. Okay, we'll carry on. I had Director Nicholson and then Director Morrison. Um, thank you. So I, I, I would be good with this referral, but I would also like to know when it comes back um, what the what the timeline for doing a proper uh, thorough review of this is, is this issue because it's to me it seems like a pretty important one in the all, overall scheme of things. Okay, good point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll try to answer that. It's a good question. Um, yeah, to be clear, I think that. Uh, if it's referred back to staff, we'll try and come up with an interim solution that's not uh, going to be as well researched or, uh, you know, as deeply engaging with the community as we would normally do in the context of, of the overall uh, modernized zoning project. Um, so I, I'm thinking the timeline would be we'd obviously want to get some report back to committee within a month, let's say, on on the interim measures that might make sense and for the committee to consider that. Again, back to the... Uh, timing of the more thorough review i think that's going to be associated with the uh, modernized zoning project and uh we're hoping to report to committee shortly on a timeline for that so i don't want to set out any potential dates but as i alluded to before i think we could be looking at you know 12 months or thereabouts so it's a, a ways off i i think the uh, uh interim measure would be you know probably uh worthwhile if that prediction is correct Okay, thank you. Director Morrison. Thank you. So I'm going to go at this from a little different tact here. So clearly we have uh, zoning, minimum lot size, the like, uh, vastly undersized for for the permitted uh, second unit. And, and this is a result of an enforcement action. So clearly there was uh, building permits issued for a single family home. Someone's come in, added the suite. The basic principle on densification, additional suites, is their connection to services. They've got a, the equivalent of a community water system. I know that we sometimes allow density based on just community water. But given the sensitivity around, uh, you know, proximity to a body of water. Uh, I don't know what the aquifer scenarios are like there, but uh, I, I would guess, and I uh, you know, would stand to be corrected, that, that there's, it's probably the original septic design 
for the original number of bedrooms for the building permit that was initially taken out for the building. So if there's been additional bedrooms, kitchens, bathrooms added that form a suite, then there's additional pressure and load that are going to be put on the services. Owner of a couple of septic systems know that you add uh, you know, increased usage, you have increased servicing, the like. So I, I guess my question would be, and I'm, I'm trying to interpret if this was what Ms. Herrera was going for, if we send this for referral, then we might actually get back information from Island Health if they're made aware that this is an enforcement action as to the suitability of the current septic situation or, or you know, uh, wastewater um, capacity of what's in place and given these are smaller lots and a lot of places are designing for having the original field and the additional uh, those are the things that I want to know is or if we end up approving this and it's not connected to a community sewer system are we going to be you know setting up for an increase uh, a greater likelihood of a septic system failure as a result of the increased usage and capacity on the property so it, mr tippett i guess the question to you is 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 that your interpretation of what ms herrera was was uh, going for with the second option is to get the feedback from the referral agencies assuming island health would be one and knowing that the referral went with this came from a result of an enforcement action mr, mr. chair uh, to the committee thank you um yes that's a really good question and i suspect that probably is what was in her mind um, because uh, as it was noted in the report, it was not referred to uh, Island Health in particular initially. I think, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think this may be one of the subdivisions that's under a combined uh, septic field under the Health Authority where, uh, you know, 10 or so homes in the same subdivision are connected to a single uh, service. And so that's, you know, if we were to proceed on a site-specific basis, with this rezoning, I think it would be imperative to get that information uh, before making a decision on this specific rezoning. Um, and uh, I don't know the, I, I, probably Island Health would have in their files what the specifications were for that, but it's entirely possible that there's not a lot of additional capacity within that uh, system design to accommodate uh, you know, either these three suites or perhaps if everyone in the block had a suite. Um, so yes, that, that's a good point. I think that if this was to be proceeded with, no matter how it occurs, as an individual application, we would need to know that first. And secondly, if generic amendment is made, which would have the effect of zoning-wise permitting this at the building permit stage, requiring an engineer's report concerning the ability of the septic field to take it. So either way, it would be uh, controlled by um, by the process if we were to proceed uh, either site specifically or generically. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I'm just looking at the. I'm 99% sure it is on a community sewer already. I'm just scanning the staff report. I can't see the sentence, but uh, if uh, other staff might know, but uh, it's actually just down the road from our house here, and I know the field, so I, I want to say it's on community sewer. So. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I believe it's not community sewer as we define it because it's uh, it is combined. Like I believe they're joined together, but I think it's under a, a island health system. Yeah, it's a it's a strata common property field. I think I, I don't want to be adamant about that, but I'm I know there are a number of subdivisions in that area that were like that, and they were developed as bare land strata for that exact reason, so they could have a combined septic area. Uh, because uh, some of the individual uh, proposed lots didn't percolate very well. Um, yeah, that sounds right. Go, go ahead, follow up, Director Morrison. Yeah, and that's exactly it. it. It says here they have a shared strata septic system, which generally they they build the capacity for the built infrastructure of the single family home per lot regardless as long as that data is researched and obtained and presented back to us whether it's in the form of the option to or referral back to staff if that's followed up on i'd be happy to support uh, either one of those thank you direct direct well i heard uh, mr tippett say that uh, that would be the case whether it was uh, rezoning or just a general if we refer it back for an interim general options is that correct yes okay so i would I did i think we moved and second that option already did we 
until a refer March. no okay so then i will move that we refer it back uh for interim general options on sweets and okay, I guess so we have a seconder, and that's seconded by director nicholson I, sorry uh, director smith i think i jumped if you were on my list i jumped right over you that's been moved and seconded in any case thank you and I think it's imperative at this time since we do have a housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Director Smith. Uh, thank you. So I'm just trying to follow this uh, process. It seems to be jumping around a little bit. We have an application in front of us and now we're moving off to um, direct uh, community planning to bring back a report to us on secondary suites and as I seem to think that we were, we've changed direction from what we have in front of us. And I'm, you know, looking at our climate change and uh, we should be looking towards um, fo smaller footprint when it comes to different things. We, we are hearing about septic and whether there's actually the capacity for the system to have these secondary suites. So are we heading off in a different direction than we should be actually looking at right now? Because in the MOCP process, I thought we would be looking at secondary suites and uh, accessory dwellings during that process. And so are we moving around in a, in a different direction and putting additional work onto staff when it should just be going through the process of the MOCP? Thank you. Just before you, before we get an answer, I see a phone number on the screen. Uh, hello, can you hear us? Applicant? Yes, hello. Hello, oh, welcome. Thanks for yes, trying. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'll just, uh, while we have you, would you like to make any comments on this application? Thank you very much. Finally, sorry about that. I had a uh, problem to come to for the technology. <laughs> But I yes. made it anyhow. Yes, well, welcome. And, and go ahead if you have any Thank comments. You. Would you like to comment on the application? Yes, well, I made the application for the, uh, for the rezoning for uh, suite in order we can rent it. And this uh, application, I'm asking for the three homes in my subdivision. Yes. Okay, so we're just discussing it now. So um, if you would uh, like, you can uh, and listen and uh, just uh, speak if you'd like to uh, to uh, comment in, in the process. So I'm just turning to Mr. Tippett now for an answer to Director Smith's concerns. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. I, for, Chair. For you, excuse me. For your information, I want to inform you that uh, on the Estrato, on 2015, when I completed the subdivision, and I had a council, I gave a, to the council on 2015, they agree for the suite, if we rent it, we should pay double fee to the Estorado Corporation. So they agree. And then also I have a letter from uh, engineering regarding the septic that three homes, it can be double and can be have a suite. Of course, suite is not separated. Is it attached to the home? So we build it like that, but of course, it still is empty and it's not renting, you know, <laughs> and it's still I don't know what to do. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll turn You're welcome, to, sir. Thank you. We'll turn to staff. Mr. Tippett. Thank you. Uh, so for... Uh, Director Smith's questions. Uh, yes, it's definitely a shift in direction. I mean, the, the the official question before the committee in respect to this report is, should these three lots be spot zoned to permit suites or not? Um, however, the, the discussion as it's evolved, I think, came out of the uh, some of the context within the report about, uh, you know, suggesting that a more systematic approach to this would be uh, would be preferred uh, rather than having to deal with a number of site specific um, applications as they might be discovered uh, through bylaw enforcement over the over the time. Uh, with respect to the modernized OCP, I don't want to speak out of turn. It's not my project, but uh, 
it seems to me that the general uh, density prescriptions in units per hectare and that sort of thing that appears in different designations are really kind of high level in terms of dealing with the principal uh, units and that the it doesn't really speak to the question of uh, secondary suites in terms of the, the core density. So in other words, uh, the question as to whether certain zones will permit uh, suites is in some degree going to be determined in the in the zoning bylaw there's other aspects of the of the harmonized and modernized ocp that will obviously speak to affordable housing and this sort of thing so um yes i mean that that further work will be done it's just a question of how long it's going to take and in the meantime we have uh we have these three properties which uh, were all under bylaw enforcement orders uh leading to this application um and uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that if it's just by law enforcement, we can't necessarily sit back and wait, you know, as long as it might take for all of that to come to fruition. And so the idea here is maybe an interim step that moves some way, possibly permitting or maybe not. I don't know yet. Uh, you know, these three lots in theory to have connections subject to engineering uh, considerations. Uh, uh, you know whether that's a good idea or not. But yeah, it's definitely outside of the scope of the two uh, principal uh, uh, rec or, uh, options, I should say, that were in Sheila's report. Okay, thank you, Director Yanni Donato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question, I guess, this is the, I'm unclear on the referral, and um, because this is under um, bylaw enforcement. I'm hoping, could someone clear up what the, exactly this referral is going to do for us? Because I'm not clear currently. Okay, Mr. Tibet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, the, uh, the referral back to staff, I think, would do two things. Number one, it would uh, bring this, uh, this report back or some variation on this report back along with a staff report that goes further in depth into discussing the possibility of a more gen general um, approach to altering suite regulations in Shawnigan Lake. I'm presuming for the purpose of this discussion, we're talking about electoral area B only, uh, because if we're not, then that's going to take a bit more effort and time and uh, report back to committee. And so the, at that point, the committee will have more options before it. They'll have the two option, well, pro probably just the, the one option to uh, to deny. They'll have the option to approve the application. They'll have another option to do some interim amendment. And uh, so to sort of tease out additional options, basically, is the point of this. And it might be that the committee then decides to have a, uh, an interim uh, measure done or approve this application or do something else. I don't know. But that's the point. It's to give more options and to talk in a bit more depth about what those options might be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we have a reasonable way forward on the floor that uh, Director Acton has moved and seconded. I would like to call the question on that, if everyone's ready. Yes, I'm hearing you, yes. Uh, no, I don't have any question. Just um, my request is, mm -hmm. as I said, I have a possibility to rent this uh, tree building because um, there are all have a soundproofing and there are all having ready to go. And then I have a lot of requests uh, and demand for the renting, but uh, I leave it empty. And this uh, one of the home is empty and the another home... Uh, uh, I, I, I force him to move out. The tenant has to move out by next month and then close yes. the door. Yeah. So um, I spent, I mean, for the soundproofing and for other things, other facility, hot water tank, everything separate. I got the letter from the uh, engineering for, for the sewer system is okay. We have water enough. Everything is fine. Uh, I'm just waiting for that. Yes, please. Yes, okay, we understand. Thank you, sir, and uh, we're working on that. Uh, Director Acton. Thank you. Um, I appreciate so it. Thank you very much. What I'm hearing from staff is it's not a big deal to uh, write this report and just have like a broad view because if we approve this application today, we can't reverse it going forward. And so just having some more information, knowing that we have a housing crisis, this could open up the opportunity for, for other places to also have suites. And I think it could also give us 
a kind of template because um, if, if we continue to have these kinds of applications coming forward before we have everyone's harmonized OCP com completed. So thank you. Okay, so one more before I call the question, Director Smith. Uh, thank you. So the, just for clarification, this report is going to be for area B only. And can we have the motion reread? Thank you. Area B only, Mr. Tibbet. Uh, well, that's that's not my call, really. It's the whoever made the motion, but that's what I thought it was about. But maybe I stand to be corrected. She's she's nodding. I think it's uh, area B zoning bylaw nine eighty five. So it's area B only. Okay. And the motion, do you have it there, uh, Amanda? Yes. I. Oh, sorry. We're so we're about to uh, to uh, go ahead and vote on this motion. So if you could, do you have any final comments? No, okay, go ahead, please, Ms. Ferguson. Yes, so I have to refer back to staff for interim general options for application uh, RZ21B03. Okay, I, I said I wouldn't take any more. Director Nicholson, one more. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make a comment that I, I, I'm supportive of this um, for Seanigan, but I, I think that there should be distinction between, because because these, this kind of discussion really relies on servicing and the availability of water, that for the areas in the Coke Silo watershed, we have to look at those differently. Right, okay. All right, let's call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Great, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you on the phone. Okay, so it's 2.37. Let's take a 10-minute uh, recess. We'll be back. I think we're missing the good jokes. Video's live. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. So let's turn to the next item on the agenda, please, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. R4 is a report from the Inspections and Enforcement Division, Rebylaw Enforcement 2022 First Quarter Report. And uh, this is for information. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have Mr. McDonald with us or anyone? Bylaw. Yes, Mr. Chair, this was just for information only. Mr. Harris is here if there's any questions. Okay, welcome, Ms. Harris. Mr. Harris. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any questions? Director Acton. Yeah, I guess I was really shocked to see that uh, how much uh, building in, uh, building permits have increased over last year. Um, I guess uh, have we do we kind of share this information with? planning when we hear statistics like uh only Point five order. sorry might be the next agenda item um when we hear uh st statistics like only five thousand people uh growth over the next what was it 10 or 20 years it just seems like there's a lot more growth happening than what we're predicting Right. I think um, Director Martin was right. We might we might be on the uh, next item, which is building inspection. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, no I, worries. <laughs> Any questions on bylaw enforcement before we? That was just for information. Go ahead, Director Nicholson. Thank you. I was just wondering. Uh, I, I believe we're putting in place a. Uh, a system for a different system for data collection and, and monitoring complaints and so forth. Is that where are we at? Where are we at with that? <clears throat> um, through the chair, I'll refer that to uh, Mr. McDonald because um, I don't know what the status is regarding that situation. Mr. McDonald, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's in a process of our um, old management uh, land use management system. So uh, we're still. I, I would. I imagine a few months away from the selection process, but um, that will be part of that. And some of the tools that will come with that will also aid uh, building inspection and uh, 
by law enforcement. Okay, Director Nicholson. Okay, maybe the better question is, when do we expect this to be up and running? <laughs> Mr. McDonald. I may defer that to Mr. Rolf. I don't know the answer for that question. Mr. Rolf. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to Director Nicholson, I believe that the timeline for expenditure of the grant funds that we got is um, to September 2023. So we are looking at completion within the next year. That's the worst case scenario. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on bylaw enforcement? Director Smith. Thank you. Uh, the word unsightly, can you give a good description of what unsightly I see Area G has and unsightly, and I'm not sure if it's Area G or Saltaire or a Gulf Island. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Harris. Sure. So uh, through the chair, unsightly generally, without actually reciting it right out of the book, is um, old, useless, discarded items of no value um and, and garbage uh repulsive to the site okay good with that director smith i think so i was just All looking right. for clarification if it was a gulf island or if it was saltaire for area g thank you okay i'm not sure if mr harris can answer that i, I don't actually understand the question that she's posing Director Smith. Uh, I apologize. The um, report indicates that there was in Area G one unsightly. I was looking for clarification if it was Saltaire or one of the Gulf Islands that was the one unsightly. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, Mr. Harris, we couldn't hear you. Yeah, through the chair. Um, I don't have that location information in front of me at this time, so I cannot comment if it was in Saltaire or um, the asylum. Okay, thank you. Director Acton? Uh, since we were asking about um, items coming back in a way, um, I'm, are we expecting the the bylaw review to come back? Hmm. We'd like to take that one. I'll do it. Mr. Chair, um, we're working with the consultant. I was in discussion through emails with him on the weekend, and it looks like uh, for our schedules that he'll come back with a final report at the June 15th ESC meeting. Okay, thank you. Director Morrison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the staff, uh, just given the the fact that we're uh, we're going to uh, be implementing some uh, some higher uh, tipping fees and the likes at uh, our waste transfer stations, and the fact that we're having an unusually wet spring, uh, I'm I'm just wondering if there's uh, maybe a little increased attention given to uh, the uh, waste management side of things like it, it just it happens every time we we bump the fees or or start covering something that wasn't previously covered um, like the commercial loads of uh, yard and garden that we start to see the uh, illegal dumping in the in the woods and that sort of thing so is there uh, any special attention or, or work being given to uh, that sort of thing or are we just uh, waiting to hear from our you know our dedicated uh, outdoor user groups to uh, report new incidences hey mr. Harris uh, through the chair um, there's nothing we we have planned um, in anticipation of the the fee increase, um, you know, generally that's reported by the public, um, you know, so there, there's nothing on, on bylaw enforcement's radar at this point, and we'll just uh, take it day by day. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other further questions on bylaw enforcement? Seeing none, so that was for information. Thank you. So we'll go now to 
Uh, the next item, uh, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next item is R5, Report from Inspections and Enforcement Division, Rebuilding Inspection, 2022 First Quarter Report, and this is for information. Thank you. So uh, we're, back, we're back to, I don't know if there was a, is just for questions, I assume, Mr. McDonald? Yes, to you, Mr. Chair. There's no presentation and uh, the report is self-explanatory. Okay. Any questions? Director Martin. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for, to staff for the report. Uh, just interesting in, uh, interested in uh, numbers that might be pending on building permits. Um, do you have any data on that? Do you, Mr. Chair? Um, generally, I have compiled that sort of information, but um, my apologies for this time around that I didn't look to see how many files we've sit got sitting on the books. So, though, from just walking back there, I suggest that we have a fair amount. Okay, I'll add that to my list. <laughs> okay. I will provide that next time. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Director Acton, did you finish from before? We can't hear Thanks. you. Thanks. No, no. no. <laughs> um, Oh, I was just asking if there was, it, it, it had increased like 33%, I think I saw over last year. Um, is this a shock or does this kind of correspond with the kind of growth that we're expecting in the region? And are we sharing this information with maybe planning so that we can kind of, you know, double check some of, some of that um, information that we're using to plan with? Okay. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is something I think that everybody's realized that uh, over the last few years that there's been a real uptick in uh, new housing construction and uh, the, certainly the, the shortage with the, of housing in the valley. Um, as far as working with planning department, I think they also see an uptick in development permits as well. So uh, it, it, I think it's fairly obvious to everybody that there's uh, quite a high demand right now. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, that was for information. So we will move on to the next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next item is R6, Report from Inspections and Enforcement Division, Re-Amendments to Ticket Information Authorization Bylaw uh, 3209. Uh, and the recommendation is that CVRD Bylaw Number 4428, Ticket Information Authorization Amendment, Schedule Changes Bylaw, 2022 be forwarded to board for consideration of three readings and adoption. Okay, thank you. Mr. McDonald? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, every once in a while, we probably annually or a little bit better, we take the opportunity to look over the bylaws and the MTI bylaws. Sometimes uh, there's some errors made, and I, I've noticed that there was a bunch of schedules that didn't quite line up. So most of these were just housekeeping, with the exception, I think, of Schedule 10 in the soil bylaw. So there's one extra added uh, fine there. And that came out, of, it was actually missed when we brought the new soil byline in, so there wasn't a fine for that. And that was um, for uh, depositing soil not in accordance with the, the zoning. So uh, probably something like somebody processing soil on site or something. And we chose a $1,000 uh, fine for that, which is uh, in accordance with all the other fines that are similar to that, that we for those kind of things and infractions. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Director Nicholson. Um, I am wondering about whether a thousand dollars for a soil infraction ticket is adequate. Hey, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have found that to be very uh, has worked very well. We have issued a few of them. Okay, Director Kuhn. Um why change the uh, building inspector to building official? I find that uh, a little bit, I don't know what the reasoning is because everybody knows building inspector, but building official, I mean, that's like, like that, that could include everybody uh, that, that has anything to do with building. So I, I, I don't know what the reasoning of, of that is. Mr. McDonald? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the answer to that question is because our building bylaw calls it a building official. So in a future amendment of the building bylaw, 
uh, we could correct both those at the same time if uh, building inspector was a more appropriate choice. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so there's a recommendation there. Someone like to move that? There's Anne. Anne wants Mr. to Trill wants to speak. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Ms. Trill. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just with respect to the building official question, the, um, the industry in the industry, they are referred to as building officials, and their um, certification program is structured around building officials. So that's part of the rationale. Okay, thank you. All right, would so like to move the recommendation. Moved, seconder, seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Okay, so we'll now move to the next item, please, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next item is R7, report from the Planning Strategic Initiatives Division, Re-Advisory Planning Commission Bylaw number 4408 as amended. And this item was referred from the April 27th, uh, 2022 board meeting. Uh, the recommendation uh, is that CVRD bylaw number 4408, Advisory Planning Commission Establishment Bylaw 2002, be amended as outlined in Attachment A to the May 3rd, 2022 staff report from Planning Strategic Initiatives. Number two, that the CVRD bylaw number 4408, Advisory Planning Commission Establishment Bylaw 2002, as amended, be forwarded to the board for consideration of three readings and adoption. Thank you. So any um, comments, I guess, Mr. Turoff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I can speak on behalf of the Strategic Initiatives Division as um, Ms. Green had to step away, but um, this has been to the board a couple of times, um, so you may perhaps be getting tired of it somewhat. But um, the first at the first board, the, um, the um, inclusion of our regional planning, or sorry, regional advisory planning commission was removed and at the last board on April 27th, there were a couple of resolutions passed. One was increasing the number of APT members from 10 to 11 and um, replacing the words um, make reasonable efforts in section 4.2 with, uh, with shall. Um, the, there is an attached track changes bylaw um, in the agenda. I will note there appears to be some um, funny things going on with the PDF, so you might be, if you read that carefully, you may see some <laughs> some strange wording where it looks like there were a couple sets of um, track changes that are showing. Um, I did want to um, sort of clarify that when we, in our, in our bylaw drafting, we used the word will rather than the word shall, so we would, um, if you want to proceed with that, we would, um, we would take the, the license to just to use the word will instead of shall. Um, but the other um, issue that arose at the board, which um, generated quite a bit of conversation, was around the um, the provision of administrative and other support to the advisory planning commission, and that was in section referred to in section. Let's see, section thirteen, I believe, um, five. 13 of the bylaw, towards the end of the bylaw, where um, the general manager um, and the wording was, uh, will may arrange reasonable administrative support for each APC and discussion about changing that to, again, to will. Um, and so at that point, the, the, the bylaw got referred back to committee. So I would, uh, I would defer to the committee to discuss how you want to proceed at this point. Okay, thank you. So this is our third look at this. I hope, I think we're getting there. Um, any questions? Director Marvin. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, staff, for this. Uh, I think I am running into some of those issues you mentioned about um, the PDF not quite reading right. And I'm wondering if you could help out just by perhaps reading what it will state in 4.2, the new 4.2, because I'm not sure. I see some strike through on my version, and just I'm not, it's just not making, it's not clear. 
So the new version of 4.2 should be um, the general manager will notify the director for the electoral area when a referral is made to the electoral area director's APC. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, thank you. And um, as for shall versus will, I, I think you were asking if <laughs> the difference in the word, um, you know, my preference would be, I don't know, I think it's either one, thanks. Our legislative uh, services folks would uh, respectfully request that we use will rather than shall. <laughs> Director Morrison. Yeah, I, I can understand the rationale for will and uh, would be prepared to move the recommended text and resolution. Excellent. That's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd like to call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Excellent. Uh, next item, please, uh, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next item is R8, Report from the General Manager, Land Use Services Department, Redevelopment Application Referrals Policy. And the recommendation is that the CVRD Development Application Referrals Policy be approved. Thank you. So I see, is that you moving it, Director Yanni DiNardo? Okay, moved. And Director Kuhn, you seconding it? No? Uh, no one seconding it yet? I'll second it to get it on the floor. Okay. So uh, we have uh, Director Kuhn, Director uh, Acting, but first, Mr. Trof, did you want to introduce anything or? Thank you, Mr. Just... Chair. I don't have a formal presentation prepared. Um, I can say a few words um, in that this follows um, the adoption of Bylaw 4379, which is the new Development Application um, Procedures Bylaw, and um, anticipates adoption um, of Bylaw 4408, which will be the new APC bylaw. But really, uh, um, the intent is to provide some um, a framework for how referrals can be sent um, when applications are received by land use services. And so um, the current, or the, I guess, past practice has been to um, refer most applications directly to APCs. And this, um, this provides a bit of a different framework where we would be looking at applications, um, in particular major applications for things like OCP um, amendment bylaws, rezoning, um, major temporary use permits, um, and significant variances, and actually taking those, rather than taking those directly to APC, taking those to the committee first so that you can have um, the first look at them to determine, A, whether or not you want them to even proceed, um, and B, whether um, you want to then refer them to um, your APC or other, other referral agencies or First Nations. And so it's a bit of a change, but it was an, um, a, a, the thought was really to, to give the um, committee the first shot at seeing those applications in some cases rather than your APCs. So they get out, they have in some cases gotten out um, into the community before you've had a chance to look at the application. So that's kind of the hmm. primary intent. And then we look at other minor um, applications, anticipating that those could go, um, in some cases, to APCs, um, the opportunity for, of course, electoral area directors to refer things to the APCs when they, um, they think that that uh, merit um, is needed. And, um, and then with respect to delegated applications of um, development permits, where there is um, the potential for some you know, discretion or opportunity for um, um, community input that could be factored into consideration of those um, applications. And primarily I'm talking about form and character uh, development permits that, that there's an opportunity to refer those as well. Thank you, Director Cohn. Can you put me on the list? Yeah, what, what, I'm <clears throat> what I'm missing there is um, any effort to uh, notify the area director as to what is happening. It's, it's frustrating and embarrassing uh, to face a question from a resident about an application that the area director hasn't even heard about. 
And I, I think that shouldn't be acceptable. I, I've been in that situation twice now, and uh, it frustrates me. I, I think we should get, uh, if not a copy, but at least a notification saying, okay, this is what was was filed yesterday or whatever, um, just to notify you. And um, and that's fine. And if there's any, any further requirement for questions, that, that's up to the area director. But at least we should know. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think that's a really important um, point um, that Director Kuhn is making. Um, and, it, and it kind of speaks to um, the lack of information that has been provided in the file opening letters that directors have been receiving. So you essentially get a letter that says an application has been opened, but it really provides no information about the type of application and, and what it is uh, or the potential that that application might have um, for impacting your community. And so we are reviewing our intake procedure to, um, to, with a view to providing more information in those um, application file opening letters. So it'll be very clear to you what it is that's actually being applied for. Can I follow up? Yes, I, I wonder, it, I, I think I brought that up once before quite a while ago. Uh, and I think the reply from you guys was uh, that I could get that over over the web uh, going into CVID. What, what I'm interested in is it would be nice, let's say, monthly or maybe quarterly to get just a count of, okay, so many apl applications are pending in your area. And, and I don't even need comments as to how they're doing, but just to keep track as to what is happening there. Uh, just a simple... Um, the, the the next four applications are pending and and, and uh, whatever and so it it gives us a better feeling as to what's going on without us having to go into the CVRD website and let's face it it's not easy nowadays to get a hold of any of your planners uh, I've ha had I've had several problems now and and it's starting to annoy me uh, and, uh, and quite frankly to get a hold of you as well uh, so. Uh, if we want information from a uh, uh, planning department as to uh, where do we sit with a certain application, uh, I was faced with that just a, a little while ago, and um, uh, I, I tried to get the information from you. You were not available. Uh, I had to find out who is the planner who is working on that. Then finally I got a hold of Mike Tippett, who told me, oh, yeah, uh, there's these two planners that are then. Uh, no, I, no, I was referred to to uh, Linda, by the way, and then Linda phoned me back, said, yes, these people are in, in, uh, involved in the application. And then finally, I phoned one of them. The other one was not available. I phoned one. It was a, a go-around, finally, to find out as to, okay, where, where is this application sitting? And I don't think we should have to do that. I think that should, that should be coming automatically somehow. Thank you. Mr. Rolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the things that our, um, that our planning staff are working on is um, changing the way that we're reporting on the applications that are coming forward. So if you were to go to our website, you would have found them and that you would have had um, all of the development variance permits are listed together, rezonings are listed together, and subdivision, et cetera. But it's not really useful to you as an area director or a member of a particular community who wants to know what's going on in your community. So we are changing the structure of those reports so they're based on electoral area and that's the way that they will be posted on the website. The other thing that we can do is we can have those reports emailed um, to the directors on a, um, a weekly or bi-weekly basis and that will give you a much better idea of um, what's going on in your communities um, and the status of those applications. So that should help immensely. That would be great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I agree. That would be great to have them by area. So I have uh, next to uh, Acton, Morrison, and Nicholson. Director Acton oh, and Smith. Okay. Thank you. So what what I first heard was the process would be changing, Ms. Chiroff, a little bit, where the application would come to us, and then we could refer it. So that would be helpful, Director Kuhn. Um, and so I, I, I like this idea. It kind of switches the culture. I feel like, you know, when we want to, um, refer to our APC, it becomes a bit of a battle at committee when it's something that we, 
you know, kind of look forward to is, is community input on these things. Um, and so if you were going to change anything, you could, I think you could also get rid of that email that you mentioned. Like we get the email that says somebody has put in their $200. It's, it's just adding another step for somebody that I don't think is necessary. Um, and then I think I just lost my question. Anyway, I, I like the idea of, oh, I know. Uh, on your, uh, you, I don't know. I was trying to find how it would be listed. So for example, the application today with a house with a variance being built uh, in the repairing area on Shawnigan Lake, how would that be classified? I, I couldn't figure out. Right, so we so we would have looked at that um, and under um, number part A3 of the draft policy, that would have been um, an application for a development variance permit where the requested, requested variance is um, more than 50% or sorry, under number two, rather, major. <laughs> so it's more than 50% of the um, applicable regulation would be uh, is what, what the variance is requested for. So for instance, the uh, lakefront setback 15 meters and they want to go to five meters within the lake, then that we would consider that a major variance, right? And so that would be referred to, to the APC. So I consider it a major bear. I consider it major just for the fact that it's in the repairing. So can that wording be included in this kind of bylaw? Sorry for you, Mr. Chair. I, I misspoke. So that an application, that type of application would be considered major. So it would come here first. However, but not um, because of, I'm saying not because of the 50% piece. I'm saying because it's in the repairing area. Yeah, so there's an opportunity. I mean, certainly the recommendation of the um, before you is that this policy be adopted. But if you want to make changes to the policy, or if there are other criteria that you were um, that you wish to have um, considered and added to this, that's absolutely fine. You can send it back to staff, and I can we can <laughs> do some more work on it. Um, well, I, I would definitely want to see that uh, yeah. that added in if I could. Should should I? Well, I think yeah, I'll let others speak, but I, I really hope that we include that kind of language in there. Okay, because I think it has been moved and seconded already. But we'll go with the, the, we've got Morrison, Nicholson, and Smith. Director Morrison. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, I was reading through this, and there's some things in here that I'm I'm liking. Um, I I do concur with uh, some of what Director Kuhn was saying, in that uh, I I've. In in fourteen years, I the last couple three years, I've I've felt more, and maybe blame it on COVID. I've felt more disconnected from the the planning activities in in the CBRD uh, than than I've felt you know the other eleven. So um, I, anything that's going to ensure that um that you know we're not getting stumped on the street with something that you know obviously a community member or developer thinks we will have good first-hand knowledge of um so that's helpful uh one other point that i'd like to make and and i perhaps ms trolf can explain what the 50 percent number is and and the way i'm looking at this if there's a 10 meter um 10 meter setback and somebody wants to go more than um, you know, 2.5 meters. Like I, I, I don't think 50% is the threshold. I think it should be 25%. Uh, and and unless there's good rationale from where the the 50% came from, then uh, you know I'd like an explanation for that. And I'll finish on the thing that I think is is really good um, is the under Part B delegated applications. And and I think this is what we need more clarity on is the reference to the very last sentence will be referred to the applicable APC for review and comment on the discretionary form and character elements of proposals only. So that's basically, is, is that telling us that it'll be referred to the APC for the, um, the matter that is applicable and not other wish lists that we think that they should be referring or commenting on? Mr. Three, Mr. Chair. So yes, the intent of 
uh, a referral of a development permit would be only on a referral of a development permit where it was for the form and character of the development where the community has, you know, best sort of first-hand knowledge of the form and character of their community and that would be what the limitation of the uh, conversation should be around as opposed to, um, you know, discussions about um, riparian assessment reports or geotechnical reports which are, you know, reviewed by professionals or prepared by professionals. So that, that is, um, yes, so that is a limitation that is proposed. Okay. And the 50% number, 25, what's, what's the rationale for that? And a 50%, uh, it was, what would be the difference between major or minor if you were to, um, and certainly that could be, um, that number is, is completely up to the discretion of the committee. And it, uh, it might be different if it's um, a setback variance. It might be different if it's a height variance. Um, but for the purpose of a generalized policy, 50% would seem to be a reasonable number. Something less may also be reasonable in your view. <laughs> okay, before I know, Director Morrison, you have to leave shortly. Do you have any, you good? Any final? Well, there's questions? one last thing that staff have always done and that is acknowledge when there's a purely political application come in the door and it didn't matter what the policy said, it got referred to us. Is that still going to be the case? It's true. Um, we, could, we could, I mean, I mean that is an interesting question because when you talk about um, OCP amendments or rezoning applications, even development variant permits, they can be highly political, but they're also completely within the board's discretion as to whether or not you approve them, right? And so, um, again, the intent of this is to screen those out, be able to say, yes, this is probably going to be of significant interest to the community and it should probably go to the Advisory Planning Commission for discussion. Um, or if it's, you know, significant under the condition of major, then it's coming to you first, right? And then if you want to refer it to your ATC, of course, have the ability to do that as well. Very good. So, Directors Nicholson Smith, did I miss anyone? No, Director Nicholson. Thank you. Um, I think this is generally heading in the right direction. I would agree with Director Acton on the issue of sensitive types of riparian things. Other sensitive sites ought to be considered uh, major. But what I'd like to talk to talk, ask questions about right now is about the. Uh, Community Parks uh, Advisory Commissions. So it's only mentioned once in here under number eight, under minor applications. And it's it's my experience that, or I've, I've seen over the, over the years, if quite often parks commissions are overlooked on providing advice. And I think because community connectivity is such an important uh, issue to the community, and because parkland is such an important uh, interest of the community, that we really need to make sure that we don't miss them. And I often think that having a joint APC Parks Commission to talk about uh, that kind of land use thing would be a good idea with some of these applications. So I'm wondering if you could speak to how you've thought about Parks Commissions in this. Ms. Chernoff. So the proposed policy is that um, MOTI subdivision applications which would require um, parkland dedication or cash in lieu would be referred to the Community Parks Commission um, prior to going to the ESD. So we, we, we are recommending that, that that happen and that we get that input. I think that the distinction here is that we're not recommending that they go to the APC and you potentially end up with two different recommendations. <laughs> so, um, you know, the intent was to give it to one, one body for um, a decision and then to have that decision uh, or recommendation come forward to the AAC for consideration. And then at that point, if you feel um, like another referral is necessary, like to an APC, then that would be, you know, entirely appropriate. Follow-up? Um, okay, I have two, two follow-up questions then. So in number eight, it says may, and should it say will? If if the intent is that that happen? 
We could change that to will. <laughs> I think that would be good because we have missed some in the past. And um, so, I, I, again, I think there's an opportunity. I mean, our goal is to get really good advice from the community. And if there's a difference of opinion in the community about something, I think it should be worked through by the community. So it's kind of, from my perspective, I would much prefer, you know, to have have both committees look at things because it, it's it, it's really important. And particularly as we are moving into so much more development um, so quickly. Um, so I'm wondering, can, can, could, they, could we have it so that they could jointly meet and talk about an application like that? Or? Through you, Mr. Chair. So the, um, they're under two different establishment bylaws. So they would, um, each body, both the CP, uh, Community Parks Advisory um, uh, Commission and the Advisory Planning Commission, would need to convene their own independent meeting. Um, the meetings could be held in tandem um, so that they could, you know, discuss the matter at the same time. And then I, I presume they, you know, would come up there with their own independent recommendations as two separate bodies. It's a bit clunky, but that could certainly happen. Or you can, um, as a, an electoral area service committee and, and board, decide that you want referrals for um, the parkland question to go to both um, the Community Parks Advisory um, Commission and to the Advisory Planning Commission. Um, we are, however, hoping that you'll streamline the process because, um, you know, it, everything takes time and <laughs> costs money, right? <laughs> okay. Comments? So, Director Smith. Thank you. I would like to go back to a comment by uh, Director Kuhn in regards to uh, directors receiving information. I think that after the development uh, service, land use services review, there was m quite a bit of discussion within the directors uh, with regards to that review and the um, lack of communication in regards to the applications between the staff and the director of the area. And I'm not sure how long ago that review was, but I think we've had that conversation a couple of times through meetings and, you know, it seems like a lot of time has gone by and uh, Director Morrison did indicate that he's, uh, he's definitely seeing a shift and a change in that. And it's very hard when you look at um, part A, number seven, for an elected, an electoral area director may refer major or minor applications to the APC for comment prior to consideration by the EASC, provided the application is complete and the application has not yet been published on an EA, on an EASC agenda. Well, if we don't know any information on that application, how can we come up with a decision to refer? So I really think it's important that even though you're uh, indicating that it is a change is coming, we'd like to see that change sooner uh, to make sure that we can uh, work within our APCs and get community feedback and also be aware of the applications and what they actually are for. And uh, the letter is great. It gives us a good heads up and a good start, but it would be nice to be kept in the loop. So just passing that along, that sooner would be better than another couple of years. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think uh, Director Acton was talking about a referral motion, but go ahead, Director Yanni DiNardo. Thank you. I was just wanted to speak to Director Nicholson's point. Um, in Area D, our Parks Chair also sits on the APC, so she informs the Parks Committee. So that's how we resolved that issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Director Atkin, I was just saying that were you thinking Sorry. of a referral motion? Pets doing strange things. Um, yes, please. I, 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 I would like to refer it and include um, what was discussed about uh, in the riparian area. 
or sensitive areas, however we want to word it. And I and to Director Nicholson's point, I think is really important as well um, with uh, including parks in some way to ensure that uh, these uh, applications have, because I've, I, we, we are, have heard many times the Parks Department say, oh, you know, there's no interest in that piece. And, and, and I think, well, where, where is that information coming from? I haven't seen any kind of current uh, connectivity uh, plan for, for our areas. So I think it's really important that if we have the opportunity to uh, take these small uh, land uh, gifts or whatever we call them, um, to, to be able to take them for future generations. Okay, thank you. So you're making that motion. Um, Refer back to staff to update some of the language that we discussed. Okay, and that was seconded by Director Nicholson? Yes, okay. Any discussion on the referral motion? Okay, Ms. Churl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for, uh, for my clarity, there was discussion about the uh, 50 percent threshold for minor versus major and I would look for some direction around um, whether or not the committee as a whole feels that that needs to be a smaller number or if the 50 percent is acceptable. Okay go ahead Director Acton. Well I would admit also admit 50 percent sounds pretty big large. Um, that sounds like a pretty major uh, shift in in what's there now. So unless you have examples of of the fifty percent not really being that big of a deal, then maybe we should decrease it. Well, through you, Mr. Chair, it really it really depends on the context, right? So if you have a small lot, <laughs> you're looking at a fifty percent height variance. So that could be a really significant height variance. If it's a large piece of land, it may be absolutely um, insignificant to neighboring property owners. It's really just provided as a, a threshold for trying to sort major and minor, but it, it may be that the the 50%, um, I mean, we could deem all development variance permits to be minor in nature and, and refer them directly um, to an APC, but that we'd also don't want to bog down APCs with really minor applications, right? So I could do some more work um, in terms of trying to um, sort of finesse the, the thresholds for, for variances to for maybe provide some more options there. Thank you. So I have Director Kuhn and then Nicholson. Director Kuhn. No, I'm fine. I just wondered if, if you really need to refer it back now or, or could this be done kind of on the fly now, I, I hate to keep delaying, delaying, delaying. Uh, if, there's, if there's a requirement, yes, fine, but I'm, I have the impression maybe uh, there's no need to refer it back. Okay, uh, Director Nicholson? No, I, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. If, if Ms. Cheryl could do a little bit of an analysis around that 50%, that would be good, thank you. Okay, all right. Looks like we're ready to call the question on the referral. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Great, thank you very much. Um, where are we at, Ms. Ferguson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're uh, going to move on to question period now. Uh, just going to double check the... No requests for question period, so uh, it's just closed session now. Okay, so, we've, so um, how do we do? Do we adjourn open or do we not, not yet? So we're going to need a motion to close the meeting under section, under the community right. charter, section 90, sub 1E. Okay, could I have that motion, please? Moved and seconded. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you very much. So we'll log out of this one and log back in to the new link to closed. Correct. Great. Thanks, everyone.